Back a few years ago, I planned a big solo excursion in the backcountry of Alaska. It was going to be a long weekend of camping and fishing throughout different areas my family had suggested. My dad had been born and raised in a small town outside of Anchorage and grew up hunting and backpacking across the entire state for most of his youth. Growing up, hearing all the incredible stories, it seemed natural to plan a trip of my own to go back out and see everything that my dad talked about. It was a pretty bare bones trip. I'm an accomplished outdoorsman, but I knew better than to take the Alaskan bush for granted. I didn't take a plane into the isolated deep country or even hike off the grid that far. I chose instead to stick to some known recreational areas for campers and fishermen. I took some back roads to create a little distance between myself and others, but it was still within a mile or two of the next camp. I found a nice inlet along a river that my dad told me was a supreme fishing location. I guess something had changed over the last 30 years because I didn't even get a bite the entire first day. There wasn't anyone around, but I could see some evidence of through traffic, maybe even some local riffraff. There was bottle caps, scraps of plastic, nothing major, but enough to tell me that people had been there. I tracked upstream for a couple of miles, found deep pools that I could actually see fish in. Still, didn't get a single bite. I changed my fly setup, and still nothing. I was starting to think I was doing something wrong when I watched all the fish go totally bananas and then blitz in every direction. I thought this was kind of weird, because when fish panic, they usually all go in the same direction, at least when they initially break. Shadows or objects that pass over the water will pass in one direction, so the fish will naturally swim away from whatever it is that spooked them. That's not what I watched though. I could see them all free floating against the water, choked up at the back of a pool, just waiting for food to drift downstream to them. The next second they were swimming both up and downstream, some even jumping straight up out of the water. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen a school of fish do, like they'd been hit with an electric collar or something. I just chalked it up to bad luck and continued to move upstream. I had some luck before the end of the day and pulled a few out for dinner. As I moved upstream, the woodland around me opened up into this rolling meadow where the water had more room to spread out, creating fingers of water that flowed in multiple directions. I spent some time here checking my equipment, fishing the pools, and just generally enjoying the view. The sun poked out over the cloud cover and burned some of the chill off. There's this weird buzzing noise. I heard it when I first entered the clearing, but it went away pretty quickly, so I just figured my ears were buzzing or something. I would hear it periodically throughout the next hour that I was in that clearing, but just for a moment, and then it would cut out again. I looked over the terrain, thought maybe there could be someone with a quad or a dirt bike somewhere further in the valley. It was so quiet that I was certain it had to be at least five or six miles away. Whatever the case was, I ended up losing interest as the day went on. There's only so much daylight to do your thing out there, so after I secured my fish, I took some light hiking for the rest of the afternoon, climbed some mild slopes, snagged some gorgeous photos, and slowly made my way back down the river and toward my camp. All day long, I didn't see or hear anybody, short of that buzzing sound. As I made my way back down the river gorge, I thought I spotted someone along the far bank slinking behind the tree line. I came to a full stop and waited for them to re-emerge. I was camping in a place totally foreign to me, so being friendly just made sense. I wanted to touch base about the river and any potential hot spots for fishing, especially since I was going to be here for the next couple of days. No one came out though. I looked back and forth, even took a few steps backward just to get a better view of the thicket. I started to feel a little weird. I was certain of what I just saw. Why would they hide from me? I shouted a hello, but got no response. With a whole new resolve, I started bucking back to camp in a quickness. I kept looking over my shoulder for another mile, but didn't see anyone. I started to play out more realistic scenarios inside my head. Maybe I didn't see anyone at all. It was more likely just some shadows or branches, maybe even leaves playing tricks on me. Could have even been a small animal coming to check me out. There was a bend in the river ahead, 
so I took the time to bury myself in some of the foliage and just scan the trail behind me. Sure enough, I spot that same guy, creeping maybe a quarter mile behind me. He's moving very deliberately, not trying to disrupt the bush or make any discernible sounds. It was almost a trip just to watch him in his element, not knowing that I could see him. After a few more minutes, he looked up, saw me, waved, and then disappeared into the trees. What the hell? The whole thing was weird, but the strangest part was he looked paramilitary, especially from far away, like a tactical vest and a chest rig. Maybe he was a photographer or something, I don't know. Maybe that would explain all the pockets. It would also explain why he's being so quiet. Whatever the case, I kept my pace up and left this guy in the dust. The rest of the afternoon and evening drift by as carefree as the smoke from my campfire. I cleaned the fish, stuffed them full of garlic and butter, and had an exceptional dinner under the stars. I picked my teeth with one of the bones from a bigger fish and soaked in the essence of it all. I matched my father camp nearby, years past, and had a similar evening. It was cool to be going through the same motions in the same area as my father. I got tired early like I normally do, so I secured my campsite and tucked into the tent for the night. I had a nice roaring fire throughout the night and a canvas tent big enough for me to stand in over between a couple of trees. I listened to the crackle of the fire and dozed off as the firelight faded. Next thing I know, I'm wide awake, but I don't know why. Something is off, triggering my sense of awareness, even with my eyes closed. That's when it hit me. I can see light coming through my eyelids. My first thought is that guy by the river earlier, He's shining a flashlight through the opening of my tent. My eyes fly open to find nothing of the sort though. I'm totally alone and my tent is still zipped, and I can even see the fading glow of the coal bed from my fire pit. And by that I can judge it to be about midnight, maybe one in the morning. There's something else, a light. A little bit away from my tent, maybe 15 feet off in the trees. I listen for any sound, but there's nothing. No engine or footsteps. The road actually intersected with my campsite going the opposite direction, so there wasn't even a place for a vehicle to be over there. There was one other factor. The light seemed to be coming down from straight out of the sky, a single solid pillar just shooting vertically about 40 feet or so. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and for a few minutes, I was certain that I was dreaming. What the hell else could this be? Aliens? I doubt it. Then it disappears. All the tracings of light fade to black, and that side of my tent is illuminated no longer. I'm pretty seasoned here out in the wilderness, so I carry a gun every time I find myself out there. Since I was going to Alaska for the first time, I packed a Smith & Wesson 10mm because of the variety of predators. It's a no-joke caliber, and I kept it under my sleeping cot. The second I grabbed it, the light from the sky reappeared, this time right about my campsite. It was a solid column of light, maybe 20 feet in diameter, and a rich white from end to end. I froze. Even with that gun, I realized how powerless I was. I didn't know what to think, so I jumped out of my sleeping bag and just started getting dressed. I pulled my boots on, jammed my pistol into my waistband. I slowly unzipped the tent and peeked out with one eye. The light was so blinding that I couldn't see shit even if I looked up, but I could still see my truck and campsite plain as day. Whatever it was, was totally silent and as still as a surgeon. The light source never wavered as it free floated above me. Then I heard it again, that same buzzing. It was closer this time, but it was a dead ringer. Before I could do anything with that information, that light quickly went out again. I didn't waste any time. I yanked my jacket on, laced my boots, and made for the tree line in a dead sprint. My camp was in a bit of a clearing, but real woodland was just a stone's throw away. Thicker trees would provide much better cover from whatever it was above me. I crashed into the thicket, but didn't pause to correct myself. The branches messed me up from head to toe. It was much less of a threat than the light in the sky. I pushed through the first curtain of branches, and my faces and hand are covered in scratches. I could see a hill to my left and what looks like a rock outcrop straight in front of me. I didn't have a flashlight and had no interest in breaking my ankle out there, 
so I elected to stumble up on the hillside. Rocks in the dark was too much of a gamble, especially with how fast I was moving. I got nearly halfway up and found a big oak with thick branches, albeit totally dead amongst the other trees. It just seemed like the easiest one to climb, and I still had to cover from the other tree's shoulder up to it. I reached up and pulled myself into the scraggly gray boughs, I kept climbing until I was at least 15 feet in the air. As I'm climbing up, that same pillar of light comes to life above my campsite again. From my vantage point, I can see some of my camp and a portion of my truck, as well as the unzipped flap of my tent. The light hovers, and I can see that it's coming out of a single point of origin, but it's so dark I can't see what it is. Then it starts to move, following the way that I ran into the trees. As it cuts over the treetops along the path I made, the light goes off again. Now I'm up in the tree and I can really hear it whining and not just buzzing. At this point, I'm treed. I'm out of options. So I pull out my pistol and just wait. I dump every bullet into that thing if it hit me with that spotlight. It comes on again a few minutes later, down at the base of the hill where I forked off from the main path. It stays there for a long time and the longest of the night. After maybe 10 minutes, it shuts off and then starts doing laps of the forest. I could actually hear it buzz by me a couple of times, just above the oak that I was in. I hope that by getting off the ground and up into a tree, maybe whatever this was wouldn't be able to see me. It seemed like I was right. The rest of the night went by as you can imagine, white knuckling my pistol and just listening, watching the light periodically turn on and off. I then heard someone shout, and it was the same hello that I shouted towards the river earlier. It wasn't in my voice, obviously, but just a single call. It was almost like someone was taunting me. I climbed a little higher into the tree and hunkered down the rest of the night. By dawn, I hadn't seen or heard from it in some time, close to an hour maybe. I scampered down the second I saw the sky change color and booked it to my camp, and then dove back into my sleeping roll. I was freezing my ass off from being outdoors all night and all I wanted to do was sleep. Nothing came to bother me the rest of the trip. I made contact with one of the families camping down the road. They told me they hadn't seen any kind of light like I explained. They did hear the buzzing, however. Said it would come and go sometimes in the afternoon. Very weird, but nothing close to an answer that I was looking for. The end of the trip came. I went back home. I told my father about it and he was totally perplexed really had no idea what to make of it all. He thought it sounded like a military operation, but neither of us could imagine why they would come to bother a solo camper, someone who's probably got a gun or two. The whole thing was beyond weird, and I didn't know who to ask for a lead. Years later, I spoke to a guy who had a similar experience. He was camping in the Four Corners area in a little pocket of forest, when his campsite was lit up the same way mine was. He didn't flee from his camp like I did though. He just waited it out until it went away. He went to the forest ranger service the next day, told them what he saw, and they explained that there is illegal growing operations in the area and local law enforcement were using drones to spot the farms at night to dial in the location so they could raid them. They apologized and said the operator must have mistaken my camp as being related to the grow op. We compared notes and almost everything was the same. The buzzing, the silence, the overwhelming light, the way it floated like a phantom from place to place. I don't know who would have had a drone out there inside the Alaskan wilderness in the late 90s, but they scared the hell out of me. What I really wish I knew was if it was a civilian or government program. And I wonder if they have any photos of me from that night. In Anchorage, there's a house on the 11th Avenue near downtown that has this big multi-level deck and a hot tub on the top level, so you can have a view while hot tubbing. You can see this hot tub from the street as you drive past. It was kind of a dub there for a while. It has been since removed, at least last I saw. Back in the day, it was a real ritzy spot. All the locals will tell you about it. Lots of people passing through town and would ask about it because it looked like a celebrity lived there or something. 
This house used to be where oil corporation bigwigs and politicians would hang out. It was almost like a private club for the seriously rich and influential living here in Anchorage. Your average working class folks, however, never saw the inside. It was a party house, clearly, but many of us didn't know how nefarious it actually was. The rumor started as any other. They gambled up there, drank and did drugs, probably held a card game, probably kept hookers and showgirls, and definitely planned the future of our great state. The truth, however, was much worse than that. The house on 11th Avenue started exactly how the community guessed, but it devolved into a sex trafficking blackmail ring that would rival the stories we see on the headlines today. There was a big corporation here called Vico. It was a leader in metal manufacturing. The guys that ran this company got too big for their britches and started living a pretty lavish lifestyle. They got involved with the local cocaine scene and started brushing elbows with politicians and their dealers. Over time, these guys, from what I've been told, just couldn't be satisfied by anything. There was never enough drugs or alcohol, never enough women. The whole North Slope became fueled by cocaine, and the guys that ran this region of resources inadvertently started an underage sex trafficking ring. Between the head honchos at Vico and their slimeball drug dealers, they'd get these young girls highly addicted to coke, then bring them into the house on 11th Avenue, and that's where they lived after that. They were a fixture that people could use and abuse, and no one knew they were in there. And these girls, as long as they could get high, had no intentions of leaving. Vico started going bankrupt in the early 2000s and was acquired by a company called CH2M Hill, which I believe was based out of Colorado. Around the same time, girls started coming out against politicians and captains of business in Anchorage area with absolutely wild stories, kidnap, rape, hostage type situations, everything you'd expect from sex trafficking. As time went on, more and more girls came forward, and some of them got more serious and wanted to go to the press, put their allegations in print, and start building a case. Every single one of these women over the last 20 years has either been intimidated into silence or outright disappeared and was never seen again. Basically, the people that ran the cocaine-fueled North Slope in the 80s ended up starting a child sex trafficking ring for the purpose of serving politicians and other elites of Alaska and the oil industry. They would get these young girls addicted to cocaine, then traffic them for sex. It was all covered up by the police and local politicians, as very little of this ever saw the light of day. Whereas I'm not quite old enough to have memories of this, my uncle was a cocaine kingpin in the 80s throughout the Anchorage area. He didn't serve these people, but was involved with a lot of their dealers, so never really made anything he knew public for fear of being guilty by association. We both think it got covered up so effectively, not just because of all the police, but the people who wrote the checks for their budget were caught up in the house on 11th Avenue, but also because of the business buyout that was going on between Vico and CH2M Hill. Whether it was Vico securing its image to guarantee the sale, or Hill stepping in to eliminate loose ends to ensure their purchase wasn't bunk. Either way, the amount of power a corporation can have over a community is downright terrifying. I used to work on the North Slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we do required us to travel far out into the Alaskan Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January. The sun hadn't quite come up yet. When I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. This particular well site that we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were heading back to camp to finish our hitch and then go home. At the beginning and end of those ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. There's no cell reception or radios only work up to a distance. If you don't check in or out at a set time, 
They come looking for you to ensure that you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it really mattered in the land of endless night. We were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow, as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. When something appeared in the road, in our headlights. It was a man, in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m. It was maybe negative 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us at our tracks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed that he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled my window down and asked if he needed any help, asking if he was okay. He didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotion. Some of the other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and is in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming right off of him. He smelled acidic, if that makes any sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made my hair stand on my neck. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later told me that he was just going to try to shake him out of this stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at me and my buddy with this look of pure rage and not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There's so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and then launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy, trying to keep him inside. After several moments, and it could have only been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to that guard shack, another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards, reported what we'd seen. The guard was definitely looking at us like we were pulling some kind of prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore, and we pulled back his sleeve, there was a noticeable bruise in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard, and then were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened. It's a quiet drive the rest of the way, and we flew home the next following day. The next time we saw that guard at his shack, we asked him if he ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrol. He told us that they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift, saw nothing not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank. He'd definitely be getting us back for making him waste an entire shift driving around. It wasn't a prank though. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder today about that dude, if it even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place. And that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. Years ago, a couple of friends and I were out squirrel hunting in a creek bottom. We were on this big wilderness camping expedition and had set up some tents after Saturday morning's hunt. The day wore on into later afternoon. The clouds built up and we could hear some thunder muttering, getting closer and closer. Quickly, we grabbed a big tarp out of the back of my pickup, strung it up between the tents, having to re-pitch one of the tents to get it undercover. 
Once a year, we get the boys together for a big outdoor trip that would last about a week. This required us to keep a campsite that could support us for the duration of that time. No washouts, no wood shortage, nothing to cause consistent problems, if it could be avoided. It's hard to describe how the camp looked. We had two tents facing one another. Big old style ball tents with the external poles. The big heavy tarps was strung up, supported by cut saplings partially covered by both tents. We had the tarp pretty well staked down with the white nylon line, what we called trot line staging. The fire pit we dug out at the edge of the tarp, overhung so the smoke would clear it. With the storm coming, there was going to be no more hunting, at least for now, so we got the fire going, got a pot of coffee brewing, and something sweet cooking. I don't remember exactly what, but was bubbling on the side of the fire. We built a fancy multi-layered spit that had four squirrels beginning to roast. One of my buddies was squatting down, turning them. All of us would have a shift rotating the spit until they were finished. The storm had been teasing, but now it finally hit. Lashing rain, thunder and lightning like crazy. We are snug and comfy and all congratulating one another on how cool we are. Camped out in the woods in a storm. No one had a pistol, we just had three shotguns. Mine was an 870 pump. And I remember mine was leaning up against one of the many saplings holding up our tarp. We weren't too concerned about camp intruders. The rain was going to keep most of the predators bedded down for the night. It was torrential, the kind of rain you can't even see in. Between that and the firelight, no bears or wolves would be messing with us. Even then, we just spray them with our 12 gauges and then call it a night. We brought out lawn chairs for the big camp out, the old style, as was back around 1979. Two of us were sitting in ours, watching the third guy turn squirrels and tend to the coffee. Suddenly, and I mean so fast we didn't even see it happen, a man just stepped under our tarp and stood there, with a rifle held in both arms across his body. He'd walked up one side of my tent and was just stepping under the tarp. Instant shock and pandemonium ensued. I reared back and collapsed my chair, trying to get the hell away from this guy. I'm scrambling for the shotgun. One buddy literally fell into the fire that he was tending to because it shocked him that bad. Burned his hands and his face a bit, but his jacket took the brunt of the heat, thankfully. If he'd gotten severely burned, there's no way we'd be able to get him out of the woods and then into a hospital, not with a storm in the mud. Our other friend just jumped up and ran full tilt into his tent, knocking it all askew. He later told me he thought he brought a pistol and he was rooting around in his duffel bag, but came up empty handed. The guy that stepped underneath the tarp starts yelling something like, Whoa, 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 whoa! I get myself detangled from the chair and jumped up to my feet. I mean, we're dead meat. There's a guy with a gun right here. He's not brandishing it though. He has this bolt pulled back and he's still holding it across his chest. He's attempting to wave his own white flag of some kind. We quit hollering over one another and let the stillness creep over us. Let everyone show no sign of making a move. Even the friend in the tent poked his head out to get a look. It was a true standoff and the only one I've ever been in. If he'd been carrying that rifle in any other way though, I think we would have killed him out of fear. Potential life sentence type of mistake. After things calmed down a bit, it turned out this guy was just totally lost. He was already lost when the storm hit and was now just wandering around in the heavy rain. Smelled smoke from the fire and the squirrel cooking. Followed it right to our camp. His rifle was a bolt action 22 with the magazine. He was just some daytime hiker messing around in the forest when trouble hit. He was harmless, but the whole situation and the guy itself just gave me the creeps. He had this ear to ear grin that seemed almost impossibly wide, almost like special effects or something. I could hardly look this guy in the face because it just weirded me out that much. I don't know if the firelight cast weird shadows on his face or what, but I was the only one who seemed to notice it. It didn't seem like he blinked much either, even with water dripping in his eyes. When the man saw how bad he had just scared all of us, he apologized profusely. We wound up loading up the guy in my truck and taking him out to the pavement and up to the pipeline where his car was parked, only about a half a mile on relatively flat land. It was an easy drive, so I risked it just to get him out of camp. The guy was totally unthreatening, but he should have called out before ducking under the tarp. 
and maybe acted normal once he did. Scared us all half to death. I was in Juneau, Alaska once traveling on business. After work, I decided to drive north out of town. I was almost stopping randomly at different beaches. I stopped at one was having a great time on the beach just by myself, watching the birds fishing and looking at the tidal pools. A truck pulled up in the parking lot above me, and I didn't think much of it the first time. The truck then spun a Brody and then left and then heading north. I spent a lot of time at these remote trailheads, and you see all kinds of riffraff. Local kids smoking pot, others hooking up, all kinds of manner of reckless driving. Burnouts, Brodies, whatever the parking lot will accommodate. These trailheads are typically local to some rural communities where there really isn't much to do. So that little extra stretch of pavement becomes its own form of recreation. I wandered further down the beach. A few minutes later, that truck comes back. It parked at the overlook for a bit. The beach was probably 50 feet lower in elevation than the parking lot, and there was a bluff. They just sat there. Then they peeled out again, heading off to the south. I was a bit creeped out now, and this time I start making my way back to the trail to get back to my car. I was wearing dark clothing, so I clung to the tree lines a bit for cover. I tried keeping little foliage between myself and whatever line of sight they might have. Right about then, that truck comes back a third time. It parked with its headlights shining right towards me. As it was getting to be dusk, I just sat there. Then, for a third time it peeled out once more, but this time I could hear that it stopped, right where my car was parked. I heard the engine shut off, and right then, every instinct in me told me to hide. I left the beach and went straight into the woods, somewhat up the hill. Juno has these big trees, and I found one that had been knocked down. I laid down on the far side of it. If they had a flashlight, they'd spot me in a second. Fortunately, my cell phone had really poor connection, and I wasn't armed. I didn't carry any weapons when I traveled by airplane. All the odds felt stacked against me in that moment. I was scared shitless at this point, and then I heard a slam, slam. I knew that there was at least two people. They had waited a while, I guess to maybe see if I was coming back up the trail. Now, they were starting down the trail. One of the men appeared to have this long object in his hand. I think it was a rifle, but in the fading light, it might have been a bat or something else. He was calling out as well. Hello? Where are you? All of a sudden, I felt very much like I stepped into the most dangerous game. I remained hidden heart beating wildly. I waited until the men were well down onto the beach, and then began climbing the hill up into the woods where I knew the parking lot to be. I tried not to make noise, but that was impossible. There were dried leaves and deadfall all over. I was making a hell of a lot of racket. Fortunately for me, I don't think they heard me. I got up to my car, and the truck freaked me out. It was fully tinted. There was no way to tell if anyone was inside the vehicle at the time. I started my car and tore out of there. I have hiked alone all my life and been in far more remote places than this, but was never before or since had that same feeling that I was in some kind of grave danger. To this day, I don't feel like I overreacted, and I'm 100% positive that those men had something bad in store. Had they caught me. It was my second time hunting ever with my dad and two of his buddies. We were in southeast Alaska on an island. We had set up camp in the middle of a medium-sized cove that was shaped in a U. The shore was surrounded by a similar shaped mountain range as you went further inland. We had planned to stay for four days to deer hunt, and on the first and second days, my dad and I climbed up a few hundred feet to several spots with absolutely no luck in finding anything but meandering old growth. In the evening of the second day, our group spotted a wolf emerging from the tree line across from the cove. It laid down on the shore, and after a few moments, another larger wolf came out and accompanied to what assumed to be his mate. 
They laid next to that first wolf, and then that first wolf moved a few yards away from them. Thus, we inferred that the largest wolf was the pack's alpha male. This was the first we'd seen or heard of them in our area, at least on this trip. On the morning of the third day, it was made obvious why we couldn't find any deer. The wolves were hunting as well. We didn't see any sign of them because they weren't leaving any scent or tracks. They were bringing down all deer in the still off hours, which kept the herds hyper vigilant. One night though, they did start howling aggressively. It kept up throughout the entire rest of the trip. Now, while movies and other media imply that wolves just howl randomly and or that you can always hear a single loud howl, that's not accurate at all. These wolves were howling with a purpose to scare the deer around the cove and then to corner them. The pack started howling right at the tip of the cove, their dissonant tones echoing over miles and miles and began moving their way around and toward us. My dad and I went up once again since there was nothing else to do. This time, we were a few hundred feet up. We heard the wolves howling again, but there was one howl louder than the rest and closer than the rest. We stopped below a fallen tree trunk to listen and we heard the howl get closer and closer. I was carrying a bolt action rifle. My dad told me to load around. He pulled out a handgun and racked it as well, loudly to try to scare off that wolf. The howling draws closer up above us and a few minutes later, I'm looking up the slope of a mountain through that old growth and I see an animal moving. With its nose sniffing on the ground, the alpha wolf was not but 30 yards from us, following the scent of another animal. It had to have known that we were there by scent, sound, and sight, but for some reason just chose to ignore us. Needless to say, we didn't find any deer on that trip. I was janitor at University of Alaska Fairbanks for over five years while I was going to school. This is a little known fact, but many, many people, both students and faculty, believe that the campus is totally haunted. Everyone has different reasons, from the creepy old legends about the ground it's built on, the rumors about the people that built it, then just the good old fashioned people dying on campus over the years. Whatever the reasoning, it's pretty typical conversation to overhear about lights flickering, weird noises, etc. People just have weird experiences here and just chalk it up to the paranormal. There was one guy who didn't hear any stories, was brand new, simply didn't believe in ghosts or anything of the like. He got put on theater duty one night. This is a long shift, wherein the janitor or janitors are isolated to one building from anywhere to four to six hours, or however long it takes to clean the entire facility, swap the trashes, all that stuff. There's a second building behind the theater that's also part of that same duty. I forget the name of the building, but it's tucked between engineering building and the library. He quit that night on the spot during his shift. I was supervising a team at the time. He called me all frantic and panicked, saying he couldn't finish the building and was quitting immediately, and that I needed to come down and get the keys right now. In the back of my head, I kind of knew what this was all about because I've seen and heard a few things myself while cleaning inside that theater. I heard a few stories after I asked around, but me personally, I just really didn't care. The noises and the locked and unlocked doors and apparitions didn't stop me from having to pay my bills, so I tried to ignore it the best I could and continue to do my job. So anyways, I go to get the keys from him. He's white as a damn ghost himself, beads of sweat dripping down his face, shaking from head to toe talking about seeing some human figure drift across the stage. I didn't really know what to say to him, so I kind of just said, yeah, that that sometimes happens, man. It's, it's just noises, though. Sometimes it's the lights, sometimes it's the doors. You just get used to it all. He took off so fast and didn't stick around and talk to the boss. The boss ended up actually thinking I scared him off. He was a bit of a no-nonsense kind of guy, even though he's the one who initially told me about the ghostly encounters. And it turned out, someone actually hung themselves there on that stage, and I didn't find out until years later. It 
It was the winter of 97, I believe, and I was living in Alaska, serving in the National Guard as an 11 Bravo infantryman. I loved it. As some of you may know, a joint task force between all branches of the military began working on building a road on an island nearby, Annette Island. The Marines spent the summer building the HQ. It was a series of plywood huts and the framework of a mess hall. When summer ended, the huts were just basically sheds. There was no electricity or running water. Me and five other members of my unit were called to active duty. We were tasked with living on the island for the winter, protecting the camp. Apparently, the local native youth would hop from island to island, vandalizing vacant logging camps and such. This was classified as a training mission for budget purposes. It seemed like it would be a good time. Six months in the winter on a remote island living in a plywood hut. At first, things were somewhat rocky. There was only going to be four to five of us on an island at a time, with a weekend rotation every two or three weeks, or one or two of us. It took a couple of months before we had a real generator or propane to cook with, so we subsisted on MREs, three meals a day, for quite some time. The worst was that there was only one outhouse in the entire camp, which was placed a few hundred yards away from our camp. To make it even worse, the higher-ups, for whatever reason, declared the ground sacred. We are not allowed to relieve ourselves on it. This means if we needed to take a piss or drop the kids off at the pool, we had to march down to the outhouse in the Alaskan winter. For the most part, I was loving it. We bonded together, told jokes, played push-up poker, and overall just had a grand time roughing it. To make a longer story longer, the heart of the winter came, and so did the snow. Lots of it. By that time, we had these weird heaters that ran on diesel fuel, so we were kind of cozy in those huts. However, the one facility left unheated was the outhouse. And not only was it freezing, it was now filling up. The bay that the boat used to bring the sewage truck over on had frozen. By the third of the month, our stay in the entire outhouse's contents were dangerously close to rising above the toilet seat. It was disgusting. It was freezing. It became my nightmare to use. Give me a slit trench over an outhouse any day of the week. Even now, thinking of this massive frozen mound makes me cringe. I could still see the steam that would rise from the hole out of the vents of the porta potty after each use. So anyways, despite the bizarreness of the outhouse, it's not the scary part of the story. One night as the four of us were laying around on our cots, getting ready for bed, a few of us were listening to a book on tape that Doc had brought with him. I think it was called Contact. It was either that for entertainment or Art Bell's Coast to Coast radio show, the only English station that we could get on the radio. If you don't know who he is, check it out. It's all about aliens, Bigfoot, and other paranormal stuff. Well, we heard noises outside. And now, that might not seem scary, but let me tell you, we hadn't heard many noises night or day since we've been there. There isn't a whole lot of action going on during the winter in the middle of nowhere, especially on a frigid island without much to offer for wildlife. We hadn't seen any animal or found any tracks the entire time we were there and we had to do a fair bit of walking. At first, we thought it might be some native kids come to goof off and tag the place or set it on fire. It seemed logical. Before we came to this island, we'd been given tours of nearby logging camps which we'd been decimated. We were warned that this is what they would do to our camp if we didn't protect it. If it was them, we were ready for them. Well, to be honest, no we weren't. Who am I kidding? We would have wanted to lock and load and go on the offensive, if it wasn't for the fact that we were on a quote-unquote training exercise. That meant we didn't even have ammunition. We had M16s, but nothing to go in them. This had been a non-issue up until this point, because there had been a lack of danger. We were all no longer laying in our cots. Instead, we're getting dressed and discussing who it is that's going to go investigate with an unloaded rifle. Just then, we heard those same sounds come to our door. It was not human. We could hear them breathing, loudly. Our PFC, who was the one who had been picked up to lead the charge, flat out refused. None of us blamed him either. We didn't want this to become some Alaskan version of Southern Comfort meets Predator, if you know what I mean. So we all sat in silence for 10 minutes or so, until the huffing and snorting faded away. A few minutes afterwards, we manned up and opened up the door. We immediately saw in the snow the largest wolf prints I've ever seen. I swear they were the size of a pie plate. 
Anything attached to those paws must have been the size of a small horse or at least a dining table. We jumped up to the task, thinking we might need to ward a pack of wolves away. Started with hanging a series of lanterns along the perimeter, and then kicked on the generator for lights along the actual buildings. After that, we got fires going to burn off some of the cold. Big roaring infernos and big steel drums. We used them during the storms to navigate our way to the outhouse. The wolves started howling as we worked. Some of the other guys said they were trying to flank us. They were using their howls to try to get us to move in that direction they desired. And I gotta admit, it almost worked. That piercing sound comes blaring out of a tree stand not 30 yards from you. Your first instinct is to bolt in the other direction. We all survived the night, but made a request for ammunition that following morning. <laughs>